Christian Spirituality of the Catholic Tradition Part 18 Quietism Although Jansenism was introduced into the Netherlands when Arnold, Nicole, and Quesnel fled there from France, it is essentially a French disease. Quietism, on the other hand, had a more general infection which ultimately was localized in France, although one would be led to think that quietism is a natural outgrowth of Jansenism. The Jansenists and the quietists were bitter enemies. Knox sums up the situation as follows. We are told that, as a result of a split cell, a twin birth may take the form and not too similar, but of two complementary and therefore opposite products, like one lacks is emphasized in the other. So it was with Jansenism and Quietism. Like Jacob and Esau, they were friends, they were enemies from birth. Jansenism is Lutheranism with the Father substituted for the Bible. And the Jansenists reacted to Madame Goyon exactly as Luther reacted to the prophets from Zwickau. No one is so embittered against mysticism as the mystic Manke. Engrossed in the theological of pre predestination, the Jansenists were disgusted by the appearance of a rival sect which asked whether, after all, one's own salvation mad mattered so very much. Prone to identify grace with sensible devotion, they felt little in common with a system which regarded sensible devotion as a kind of imperfection, a sign of spiritual informity. And, above all, they distrusted quietism because it seemed to be presenting the wor world with a soft option to be underestimating the difficult of being a Christian. Jansenist and Quietist both have affinities with the Protestantism of the Reformation, but not the same affinities. In fact, just the opposite. Jansenism, as you see it in Pascal, has its doctrine of assurance, but will not hear a word about human perfectibility. Quietism believes in perfection, but denies even to the most perfect the conviction that he is saved. An erroneous doctrine does not spring forth full-grown, without any previous preparation of the minds that will receive it. Usually it begins with an emphasis on some particular point of Christian teaching, or some aspect of the Christian life, and then gradually reach at a point at which the doctrine is exaggerated beyond due proportion. Even the most holy and dedicated persons can be the unconscious promulgators of heterodox teaching. In their zeal they fail to see that they are guilty of exaggeration, or they are blind to the logical conclusions they draw from their initial statements. Moreover, heretical doctrines and movements are frequently generated as a reaction to some teaching or practice that is judged to be excessive. Overreaction and unrestrained zeal can easily, easily lead to a distortion of the faith and the ultimate loss. In order to understand the impact of the quietus doctrine and the movement that grew out of it, it is necessary to take a backward glance at those writers whom Parat classifies as pre-quietists. Some of them were authors whose works were partially or entirely condemned by the Church. Others were writers whose teaching are basically orthodox, but perhaps badly expressed. As an attitude which concentrates on the pure love of God, perfect abandonment to the divine will and the passivity necessary for genuine contemplative prayer. Quietism has been a phenomena in Christian spirituality since the early centuries. As Knox says, quietism is a morbid growth on the healthy body of mysticism, 
and mystics of recognized orthodoxy may carry the germs of the disease without developing its symptoms. The first group to have a mar marked similarity to quietism were the Alumbrados who appeared in Seville and Cadiz in 1575 and were condemned by the Inquisition in 1623. Their teaching included the following tenets. Vocal prayer is to be discouraged in favor of mental prayer, which is necessary for salvation. The absence of all sensible consolation makes mental prayer more meritorious the individual must avoid the use of all mental concepts. Even the representation of sacred humanity of Christ, the direct contemplation of God is affected by an illumination, which is nearly the lumen gloriae. Who, those who have reached a perfection do not have to re perform virtuous acts, and by a special grace they could perform objectively immoral acts, without committing sin. The perfect tend to withdraw from all worldly affairs and to disdain marriage and the marriage act. The Edict of Seville against the Alumbrados in 1623 made some church authorities suspect even the slightest taint of Illuminism, with the result that even Orthodox authors sometimes fall back under suspicion or outright condemnation. Sometimes, indeed, the inquisitors reach back across the years to condemn authors who were long since dead, such as Benedict of Canfield and John D. Berniers, whose work in the Italian translation was condemned in 1689. The spread of enthusiasm for the prayer of simple regard and acquired contemplation contributed no small measure to the fostering of quietistic tendencies. As Gilor stated, the weak and the strong, the mediocre and the good, the most morti mortified and ignorant, as well as the most understanding, almost all without discrimination, crowded into the way of prayer of simple regard. In fact, this type of mental prayer became such a fad that Surin remarked that some deluded persons talked about it endlessly, so that their spirituality is nothing but words. These people are very far from the simplicity of the Spirit of God. Their language, their sentiments, their behavior are all affected. It will be helpful to identify the individuals whose writings contribute, contributed directly to the spread of quietism and the ultimate controversy between Bossuet and Fenelon. The first name we encounter is that of John Falcone, a Spanish mercedarian who died at Madrid in 1638 with a reputation for holiness. In 1651, the Mercedarians published his most important work, Cartilla par, para Sabalir in Cristo, and in 1662, his complete works were published at Valencia. Even during his lifetime, Falcone was criticized for his emphasis on the passivity of contempl contemplative prayer and the importance of the act of faith with little or no regard for the virtues. The goal of Christian perfection, according to Falcone, was to reach the state of one unbroken act of contemplation. His works were trans translated into French and Italian and eagerly read by members of the quietist societies in Italy and France. According to Knox, however, Falcone's works would not have been condemned if it had not been suspected that Molinos was inspired by them. The second writer, Francis Malaval, was born in 1627 and blinded in an accident at the age of nine months. In 
Nevertheless, he eventually became a doctor of theology and canon law. In 1664, Malaval published at Paris a work that had great success. It was entitled La Pratique de la Veri Theologically Mystique. As the title indicates, it treats of contemplative prayer which for Malaval was nothing but an unalterable loving gaze upon God present. The purpose of the treatise was to show that God can be found by depth, by faith in the depth of one's own soul, and explain how the soul should prepare itself for contemplative prayer by withdrawing into self, rejecting all sensible and imaginative images. Like some of his contemporaries, Malaval equated the, pr the prayer of simple regard with the prayer of the simple presence of God, and he seemed to have been unduly anxious to lead the people indiscriminately into the ways of mystical contemplation. The French edition of his book was condemned in 1695, and the Italian translation was condemned in 1688. Malaval submitted in all humility and died in 1719 with a reputation for sanctity. The third writer, Michael Molinos, 1628-1696, we come to the very source of the infection of quietism. Oddly enough, it is not in his principal work, Guia Espiri Espirituel, that we find any explicit heresy. In fact, when the Jesuits Belhomo and Signeri wrote against the doctrine they found in the book by Molinos, their own works were prompted, promptly placed on the index. <clears throat> the heresy of Molinos was to be found elsewhere, as Parat pours out. If the spiritual guide considered in itself and at face value, it is little more than Malaval's Pratique Facile, or Falcone's Alphabet. Its author spoken commentary is another matter. Many competent men declare that they would be hard to put to find propositions in the spiritual guide that could be condemned independently of Molinos's other writings of his explanations and of his con confession. Since it is impossible to be sure whether Molinos lived the way he did because of his quietism, or whether he embraced quietism to defend the way he lived, we must glance briefly at both his life and the doctrine he espoused. He was born in the province of Aragon in Spain in 1627 or 1628. He was educated by the Jesuits and ordained a priest at Valencia in 1652. In 1663 he was sent to Rome to work for the beatification of Francis Simon, a diocesan priest from Valencia. For some unknown reason he was relieved of this assignment but remained in Rome, wherein he became one of the most sought-after directors in the city of Rome. At the peak of his influence he was under the patronage of Queen Christina of Sweden, who had renounced her throne to become a Catholic. <clears throat> The first work, published by Molinos, was a short tract in which he replied in great detail to the Jansenists, who placed severe conditions on the reception of Holy Communion. At the same year, 1675, Molinos published his Gui Espirituel, and in six years it went through twenty editions. The theme of the book is that the soul should abandon itself completely to God through the practice of the prayers of simple regard. 
rejecting all other devotions and practices, and cultivating an absolute indifference to everything that happens to it. Whether it be from God, man, or the devil, it is not possible to say for certain whether Molinos deliberately set out to start a new spiritual movement, or whether he simply took advantage of a quietistic and mystical ferment that was near the surface of Italian spirituality. What is certain is that Molinos became the darling prophet of quietism. As we have already indicated, there was in the 17th century an unusually great interest in the practice of prayer especially the more passive and effective types of prayer. Acquired contemplation was considered to be within the reach of all, and the means for attaining it were carefully expounded. As a consequence, the, Jesu the Jesuits, who considered formal, methodical meditation to be a normal type of prayer, while contemplation was a bit was an extraordinary gift reserved for the few, found themselves in the middle of two bitter enemies, and they were attacked from both sides. The Jansenists opposed the Jesuits for being too humanistic and for leaving too much to human effort in the quest of holiness. The Quietists accused the Jesuits of being enemies of the mystical life and incapable of understanding the higher states of prayer. On this latter point, the French Carmelites and Oratorians were in complete agreement with the accusations against the Jesuits. In the end, the Jansenists and the Quietists were condemned, but the Jesuits did not win from a, theolo from a theological point of view. Historians can do no more than surmise the reason for the condemnation of Molinos. Some historians blame the Jesuits. Some blame the doctrine he taught in his conferences and spiritual directions. Others attribute it to his moral depravity related to his teaching of non-resistance to temptation. What we do know is that after two years of investigation, the original 263 statements were reduced to 68, and these were condemned by the Holy Office. In 1687, Molino submitted and made a public retraction in the Dominican Church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome. He also confessed his guilt to the charges brought against his personal morality and was condemned to prison for the rest of his life, where he died in 1696. The scene now shifts to France, where the story of quietism ends in a violent controversy. The central character of this final scene is Jean-Marie Bouvier de la Motte, 1648-1704, the widow of Jacques Goyon du Chesnoy, and became known to us as Madame Goyon. By the time of her husband's death in 1676, Madame Goyon was already li living a deep interior life and practicing the player of simple regard. She was under the direction of a Franciscan priest, whose name she does not mention. Another spiritual director who influenced her at the time was Jacques Berthot, died in 1681, a confessor to the Benedictine nuns of Montmartre. From 673 to 680, she claims to have passed through the dark night of the soul, and after considering the possibility of entering the Visit Andines, she decided to dedicate to some form of apostolate. Leaving her two sons to be cared for by relatives, Madame Goyan went to Geneva with her daughter, Jean 
and busied herself with the introduction of young women who had converted from Calvinists. The Bishop of Geneva appointed the Barnabite Francis Lacombe as her spiritual director. From 1681 to 1686, Lacombe accompanied Madame Goyon on many journeys to France, Switzerland, Italy, or when Lacombe was transferred or went on business trips, Madame Goyon was not long in joining him. Knox suggests that Lacombe was trying to escape from her, but others think that the relationship was voluntary and immoral. In 1687, Lacombe was arrested in Paris for holding and teaching quietism, and after being transferred from one prison to another, he died insane at Cheriton in 1715. With all her traveling and numerous activities, Madame Guyon produced 35 volumes of writings. Early in her association with Lacombe, he had commanded her to write down the thoughts that came to her, and she did this quite automatically, without reflecting very much on what she was writing. In her autobiography, she states that she was overwhelmed by an irresistible urge to write Les Torrents Spirituels, <clears throat> and what surprised her most was that writing seemed to pour forth from the death of her soul without passing through her brain. Madame Guyon became seriously ill in 1683, at which time she claims to have undergone a mystical transformation. From then on, the infant Jesus replaces her so that it was no long, longer she who acted and willed, but God did all things in and through her. She was no longer personally responsible for anything she did or said. From this time on, she suffered a variety of unusual phenomena, which Porat brands as hysterical in origin. Madame Goyan then proceeded to claim an authority that came from God himself and to, and to act within the power of God himself. From this point it was only a short step to the statement attributed to Madame Goyan by Cardinal Le Camus, it is possible to be so united to God that one could knowingly perform unchaste actions with another person without God being offended thereby. In Le Torrent Spirituels, she wrote, it is the ill will and not the action of what constitutes the offense. If one whose will is lost and, as it were, swallowed up and transformed in God, she reduced the necessity to doing sinful deeds. She would do them without sinning. Small wonder that she did not go to confession for fifteen years. At the beginning of 1688, Madame Goyon was confined to the convent of the Visitation in Paris and examined for doctrinal errors but no evidence was found to indict her. Until 1693, she enjoyed great popularity and extensive influence, especially in high society, but in that same year the Bishop of Chartres became alarmed at her doctrine, and in 1695 he condemned certain statements taken from Les Torrens Spirituels. But Madame Goyon had anticipated the condemnation, for as early as 1693, on the advice of Fenelon, she had submitted her writings to Bossuet for examination. In 1694 she requested an examination of her writings and her actions by a board of three judges, Bossuet, Noailles, and Tronson. In 
The examiners drew up a list of 34 erroneous statements and Madame Goyon signed the documents, promising not to teach those particular points. The matter should have ended there, but it did not. Porat states that neither Lacombe nor Madame Goyon could have received so much space in the history of false mysticism had it not been for the controversy about them between Bossuet and Fenelon. Francis Fenelon was 37 when he first met Madame Goyon in 1688, and his first impression of her was unfavorable. She states in her autobiography that at their first meeting she felt inwardly that he did not approve of her, but after suffering over the matter for eight days she found herself completely accepted by Fenelon without any reservations. In a short time Fenelon became a willing instrument for the promulgation and defense of her teaching, as he himself testified. I have full confidence in you on the strength of your uprightness, your simplicity, your experience and knowledge of interior things, and of God's plan for me through you. Jacques Bossuet was already an old man, and he had little sympathy for mystical matters. However, as Parade points out, there was no need to be learned in mystical theology to be able to detect the deplorable practical consequences of Madame Goyon's teaching. It was inconsistent with first principles of ascetic theology. Basuet was determined to stamp out the doctrine and influence of Madame Goyon. Fenelon was equally determined to interpret her doctrine in a favorable light. The principal points at issue were the theology of disinterested love and passive prayer. When the condemned articles were drawn up in 1695, they have been worded in such a way that both Bossuet and Fenelon were able to hold spiritual doctrinal interpretations that were incompatible. When Bossuet sent the manuscript of his instructions sur les états de oraison to Fanelon in July of 1696 for the latter's approval, Fanelon returned it to him without reading it. He then set to work on his own treatise, Explication des Maximus de Saints which was published in February of 1697, six months before Basuet's book appeared. Fenelon's work found supporters among the Dominicans, Jesuits, and Oratorians, but in addition to the grim determination of Basuet, Fenelon also had to cope with Madame de Maintenon, who was resolved to put an end to his influence. Fenelon appealed to Rome in April and again in August of 1697, and his appeal was supported by Louis the Fourteenth. For the next two years the battle was waged on two fronts, Paris and Rome, until the Holy See, on March 12, 1699, condemned twenty-three propositions taken from Fenelon's book. The condemnation was couched in terms as mild as possible, because Innocent the Twelfth was sympathetic to Fenelon, and the theologians on the investigating commission were themselves divided. Fenelon submitted without reservation, and in the autumn of the same year he was named a cardinal by Innocent the Twelfth. The errors of Fenelon can be reduced to following four statements. 1. A soul can reach a state of pure love in which it no longer experiences a desire for eternal salvation. 2. During extreme trials of interior life, a soul may have a conviction that it is rejected by God, and in this state it make an absolute sacrifice of his own eternal happiness. 2. During extreme trials of the interior life, a soul may have a conviction that it is rejected by God.
and in this state it may make an absolute sacrifice of its own eternal happiness. 3. In the state of pure love, a soul is indifferent to its own perfection and practice of virtue. 4. In certain states, contemplative souls lose the clear, sensible, and deliberate sight of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, Fenelon did not explicitly teach quietism. When he was notified of the condemnation of Maximis, he, he was told that the investigators found difficult with certain statements which, in their primary sense, the sense that comes to mind, favor some quietist errors. It is true that the book contains other statements which exclude the wrong meaning of those just referred to, and which seem to be their correctives. Hence the book cannot be absolutely condemned as containing error. Both the investigators and the Holy Father felt that there was a danger that persons reading a book could be led into the errors of quietism, already condemned by the Church. Quietism was thus given a death blow in 1699, but at the same time the fears of Pope Innocent XII were realized, mysticism fell into disrepute, and, except for efforts of a few writers, the 18th century saw almost a complete rout in France of Catholic ministrum, mysticism. Return to Orthodoxy Since human attitudes and actions usually alternate between action and reaction, it is not surprising that the condemnation of quietism caused many Christians to conclude that the only safe and sure way in the spiritual life was the ordinary way of the virtues and the sacraments. The way of the mystics was considered rare and extraordinary and usually suspect. In the first half of the 18th century, the, di the discredit of mysticism had reached such a point that the classical standard works on the subject were practically unknown. The revival of Jansenism also contributed to the disaffection for mysticism, since the Jansenists placed emphasis almost exclusively on asceticism, self-denial, and the rejection of all human pleasure. Writers such as Kassad, Schramm, and Emery tried to reinstate mysticism in the face of the reaction against quietism, and other authors such as Avrilon, Jude, and Croiset tried to offset the severity of Jansenism. They represent a group of spiritual writers, many of them French Jesuits, who faithfully followed theologians untainted by any quietistic or Jansenistic infection. Many Jesuit writers attained a position of great influence in France after their restoration in 1603. Although the Jesuits themselves did not agree with each other on points of doctrine, their reputation as Christian humanists was sufficient to make them the enemies of the Quietists and the Jansenists. Louis Riquiome, died 1625, attempted to combat Christian Stoicism by emphasizing the shortness of life and the glory of the life to come. He also wrote a treatise on humility, which he divides into six degrees. Stephen Binet, 1639, a great admirer of Francis de Sales, tried to lead his readers to the love of Christ, but he had little use for mysticism or contemplation. Paul de Berry died in 1661, was ex excessively moralistic in his writings. 
which were criticized for his teaching on good works and for advocating bizarre devotions to Mary. Peter Cotan in, died in 1626, who enjoyed a close friendship with Berule, wrote a spirit of spirituality for persons living in the world. He wished to supernaturalize every human act and was criti criticized for blurring the distinction between natural and the supernatural. The man who dominated the mystical trend among the French Jesuits was Louis Lallemont, 1588 to 1635. And yet he himself never published anything. His conferences were taken down by two of his disciples, John Rigoloik and J. J. Surin. Later they were edited by Peter Champion and published in 1694 under the title La Doctrine Spirituelle du P. Louis Lallemant. As a spiritual writer, he was somewhat outside the Jesuit school of his time and he was denounced to the superior general. There is no doubt that Lalamont was in disagreement with the common Jesuit teaching on several points, but he was completely faithful to St. Ignatius in Christology. He held, for example, that the mystical state is not the result of extraordinary grace, but the normal, though rare, development of sanctifying grace, virtues, and fears of the Holy Spirit. Lalamont develops his entire doctrine of mysticism on the Thomistic teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, due perhaps to the influence on him by the German and Flemish mystics. In fact, the superior general, Vitaleschi, admonished Lallemant to confine his teachings to the sources and methods approved by the Society of Jesus. For Lallemand, the basic theme is always the same, the striving for perfection, which consists ultimately in perfect conformity to the divine will. The active phase of the spiritual life is ascetical, and it comprises all those exercises which effect a cleansing of the heart. However, Lallemand does not dedicate a great deal of time to this aspect, he develops the passive phase and consequently treats in detail of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. To explain the passivity that marks the soul under the direction of the Holy Spirit, Lalamont compares the infused supernatural virtues to the oars by which one rows a boat and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the sail which catches the wind and thus causes movement to the boat. Treating of contemplative prayer, Lallemant distinguishes between ordinary and extraordinary contemplation. The first is infused contemplation, and it is a normal development of the life of grace, activated by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Extraordinary contemplation is accomplished by extraordinary mystical phenomena. Meditation is the prayer popular or proper to those who are in the purgative state. Effective prayer is typical of those in the illuminative state, and contemplation in the prayer of union are attached to the unitive state. The initial stage of contemplation occurs in the prayer of silence or simple gaze. However, Lalamont is unwilling to separate contemplative prayer from the apostolate. He sees it in a fruitful source of apostolic activity. Indeed, the object of contemplation need not be God alone, but it may be anything seen as related to God. Among the Carmelites, John Sharon wrote Examen de Theologie Mystique 1657, in which he maintains the distinction between infused contemplation and the acquired contemplation, 
which is available to all through ordinary grace and the practice of discursive prayer. Chiron was pub particularly concerned with excesses in the mystical teaching, the vagueness of the theological terminology, and the emphasis on experience rather than theological knowledge. In a similar vein, another Carmelite, Philip of the Trinity, insists that the mystical doctrine must always rest on sound theology, and he explained the distinction between acquired and infused contemplation as follows. Christian contemplation is divided into acquired and infused. The first is natural, the second supernatural. The distinction is similar to that between acquired moral virtue, which obtained by the efforts of the will and is a natural virtue, and infused moral virtue, which God produces in us without any effort on our part. The Carthusians also opposed quietism, and their minister general, Dom Innocent Le Masson, 1628-1703, branded it as a pernicious and devilish teaching. In order to give proper guidance to the Carthusians, he wrote, Direction pour le former avec ordre et tranquillity au saint exercise de l'oraison mentality. 1695 Among the Dominicans, the outstanding authors of the period were Chardon, Massoli, Contention, and Piney. In La Croix de Jesus by Louis Chardon, died 1651, is one of the few great spiritual workings appeared in the 17th century France. According to Florand, the passages on the simplicity and unity of infused contemplation rival the most celebrated text of origin, St. Gregory of Nyssa, Taller and John of the Cross. The few writings that we have from Chardon demonstrate that a strong antipathy to the doctrine of Descartes, and I do not doubt that the confidence which Beryl placed in Descartes explains the indifference of the French Dominicans of that time for to the entire spiritual movement of Bruel. Vincent Contenson died 1674, is famous for his Theologia Cordus et Mentis, which consisted of a spiritual commentary on the Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas Aquinas, question by question. In 1699, the year of the condemnation of Fenelon, A. Mazzulli published Trait de la Veritable Horizon O la Errors des Quietistes Sont Refutis. According to Mazzulli, the contemplative prayer may be inquired or infused. The former is ordinary and can be attained with the help of grace like any other virtue, but the latter is extraordinary in the sense it is infused by God on whom he pleases. Infused contemplation is not required for Christian perfection because it is totally unmerited and because it may be granted to souls that are less advanced than others in the way of perfection. Alexander Piney died 1674 advocated a type of prayer which consisted in the simple concentration of one of the divine attributes without images or concepts that might distract the soul. He was also a proponent of the practice of the pure love of God, stating that to will to love God is itself an effective love of God. The Franciscans of this period were generally faithful to the spirit and tradition of St. Francis of Assisi and the theology of St. Bonaventure. There were also notable influences across the Rhineland mystics, 
Henry Herp and Benedict Canfeld and traces of the Berulian spirituality on the question of mortification and self-annihilation. As regards the practice of prayer, the Franciscans had accepted methodical prayer, but always with great insistence on the role of grace in the practice of prayer. Normally they classified the grades of prayer as discursive prayer, effective prayer, acquired contemplation, infused contemplation, and supereminent contemplation. The soul could pass from one grade to another, but the highest state of prayer was considered to be entirely gratuitous and extraordinary. The most important Franciscan writers on prayer are Francis Leroux, Paul Le La de Lagny, Maximilian de Bernizet, Ambrose Lombez, and Severin Rubric. Three more spiritual writers complete our survey of the authors who perpetuated the basic teaching of Berul in the 17th century and into the 18th century in France. St. John Baptist de La Salle, 1651-1719, founder of the Brothers of Christian Schools, gave great importance to the practice of discursive prayer and composed an extensive treatise on the method of to be followed by the members of his congregation. Of the three parts of the discursive prayer described by La Salle, description for prayer through recollection, application to the subject of prayer, and thanksgiving, the first part is original. The other two parts are also found in Silesian and Sulpician prayer. Recollection in the presence of God seems to be based on the teachings of Louis of Granada and St. Francis de Sales. La Salle explains that God can be present in us in a variety of ways, in the place where we are, by his omnipresence, or because several are gathered together in his name, in ourselves, either by the divine power, which keeps us in existence by the special presence of grace and his spirit, or in the church, because it is God's house, or because of his sacramental presence in the Eucharist. For La Salle, it was absolutely essential for mental prayer that the individual first become aware of the presence of God, Nothing else was as effective for withdrawing the soul from eternal things or from cultivating the interior life. Indeed, the practice of the presence of God is to be maintained through all stages of the spiritual life by beginners, by vocal prayer and repeated reasonings, for the advanced by occasional and extended re reflections, and the more perfect by the prayer of simple regard. Some souls may even attain the state in which God's presence and action are practically the only object of the soul's attention. The Jesuit John Grew, 1731-1803, was a disciple of Surin and a follower of Breuli. He served, in fact, as a perpetrator of Berulian doctrine in the 18th century, which was so sterile in spiritual literature. The theme of Gros's writing was that God is all and the soul is nothing by comparison. Therefore, the gift of self to God is the foundation of all spirituality. The gift of self, in one word, is devotion, which, for grow, meant close attachment, absolute willing dependence, affectionate zeal, a determination of mind and heart to submit to all the wishes of another, to anticipate what he wants, to make his interest one's own, and to give up all for him. It is the holiest and most irre irrevocable act of religion. <clears throat> 
The soul, says Gru, should desire perfection, but less for its own sake than for the glory of God. And this constitutes disinterested love, which at first glance would seem to militate against the virtue of hope. Actually, however, disinterested love purifies hope of all selfish love. Grau was criticized for denigrating the virtue of hope, and while he refined his teaching, he lamented the fact that some persons are so hypercritical that they make it necessary to write of spiritual masters matters only in the general and vague terminology. Gru's best writings are those which treat of Christ as our pattern and model. For a Christian, he says, knowledge is to know Jesus Christ. Happiness is to love him. Holiness is to imitate him. More closely related to Berul's doctrine than La Salle or Gru was Louis Grignon de Montfort, 1673-1716 who studied at St. Sulpice, where he cultivated an ardent devotion to Mary. He did not separate devotion to Mary from devotion to Jesus, but in his hands Barul's vow of slavery became a servitude to Jesus and Mary. He developed his doctrine by stating that all our perfection consists in being conformed, united and consecrated to Jesus Christ, Therefore, the most perfect of all devotions is devotion to Christ. But Mary is the most perfectly conformed to Christ, and hence the best way for us to be conformed to Christ is through devotion to Mary. The more a soul is consecrated to Mary, the more it is consecrated to Jesus. Then, speaking explicitly the servitude of Mary, he says, the principal mystery we celebrate and honor in this devotion is the mystery of the Incarnation, wherein we can see Jesus only in Mary. Hence it is more to the point to speak of the slavery of Christians in Mary and of Jesus residing and reigning in Mary. Together, Jesus is altogether in Mary, and Mary is altogether in Jesus. Rather, she exists no more but Jesus alone is in her. The formula of consecration to Jesus and Mary, which continues to attract many clients, is a complete surrender to Mary of all one's natural and spiritual goods. I deliver and consecrate to thee as thy slave my body and soul, my goods, both interior and exterior, even the value of all my good actions, past, present, and future, leaving the three the entire and full right of dispo disposing of me and all that belongs to me, without exception, according to thy good pleasure. For the greater glory of God in time is eternity.